chapter 24. Isaiah prophecies in this chapter about Israel's victory over Babylon and symbolically over wickedness in the world. He compares the fate of Babylon to that of Lucifer, who as Satan is bound and cast down into hell. He assures the people of Zion that if they are humble and righteous, they will be saved by the Lord. Verse number one. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave unto the house of Jacob. In the first part, Isaiah is saying that the Lord will have mercy on the house of David. He will rescue the people of Israel and bring them back home to their own land. This happens when the Babylonian empire is broken and the Israeli prisoners are allowed to return back home. In the second part, Isaiah says that in the latter days, people from other lands or people who are not originally of the house of Israel will come and join them and live with them in the promised land because they've accepted the covenants of the Lord. Verse number two, and the people should take them and bring them to their place, yea, from far unto the ends of the earth, and they shall return to their lands of promise. And the house of Israel shall possess them, and the land of the Lord shall be for servants and for handmaidens, and they shall take them as captives unto whom they were captives, and they shall rule over their oppressors. In the first part, Isaiah says that other nations or people will bring back the house of Israel from all over the world. This refers to both the Persians sending the, sending the Jews back after Babylon was destroyed and the return in the latter days where the Gentiles will bring back the children of Israel back to their own land. In the second part, we see that all the members of the house of Israel, both the newly joined ones and the original descendants, are promised that they shall have and live in the promised lands where they will rule over the ones who at one time ruled over them. And people shall take them and bring them unto their place, yea, from far unto the ends of the earth, and they shall return to their lands of promise. And the house of Israel shall possess them, and the land of the Lord shall be for the servants and handmaidens. Okay. The second part. All the members of the house of Israel, both the newly joined ones and the original descendants, are promised that they shall have and live in their promised lands, where they will rule over the ones who at one time ruled them. Verse number three, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou was meant to serve. And on that day, the Lord will bless you with rest and peace from your sadness and your fear and all the work that you had to do for other people. Verse number four, and it shall come to pass in that day that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor seized the golden cities seized? And on that day, the people of Israel will mock the king of Babylon for him having been the ruler and the oppressor is now reduced to nothing and his grand city of gold and riches is forever destroyed. Verse number five, the Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked, the scepters of the rulers. The Lord has ended the ability of these rulers to rule over anymore because of their wickedness. Verse number six, he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke he that ruled the nations in anger, he is persecuted and none hindereth. The person who kept hurting and inflicting troubles on the other nations and people is now punished and troubled and no one steps forward to help him or to stop his torment. As he is likely referring to the king of Babylon, who when the Persians, when the Persians attacked them, no one came to save. Verse number seven. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet and they break forth into singing. And when the evil is destroyed, Satan is bound and peace reigns. The people break into songs of joy. Verse number eight. Ye, the fir trees rejoiceth thee and also the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no fellow is come up against us. Isaiah uses the analogy of the fir and cedar trees of Lebanon, joyfully saying, since you have been destroyed, Babylon, there is no woodcutter who has come to bother us to cut us down for wood for your fancy palaces. Verse number nine, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Isaiah talks about how because of the wickedness of the king of Babylon, Hell itself is getting ready to welcome him into it by waking up all the spirits of the past dead villains to meet you and to greet you there. Verse number 10, And all they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as thee? Art thou become like us, like unto us? And all these dead people will speak to the king of Babylon, saying, Have you also become weak like, that, like us, unable to do anything anymore? And verse number 11, 
Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. The noise of thy vials is not heard. The worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. All the glory and the power you surrounded yourself with, you claimed for yourself, is gone. No one can hear the musicians who once welcomed or played to announce your arrival. Your bed, or what you rest on, what you lie on, is full of worms and your blanket or your covering is also made of worms. Now, when people die and are buried, this is technically what happens to the human body. And this is what happens to the king of Babylon, who, when he dies, is, ends up being thrown into some kind of a common grave, which is never found. No one has ever historically found the tomb of the king of Babylon. Verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Isaiah finally calls out Satan, using his own name and describing how he was cast and banished from the heavens to the earth. He says, How low you have fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning. You who were once so important, so bright, so um, highly acclaimed in the kingdom of God. Look at you on the ground because you have been expelled. Lucifer was once an important child of God. He played an important role in the, in the pre-mortal existence until he tried to overrule the father and was cast out along with his angels. Lucifer, having come to the earth, weakened all the nations on earth as he spread and he encouraged all kinds of evil and unrighteousness among the people. Verse number 13, For thou saidst in thy heart, said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And this happened to you because you told yourself, you encouraged yourself to think prideful thoughts about yourself, to consider yourself higher than all of Heavenly Father's righteous, faithful children, to seek to glorify yourself above them and to plan, plan to exalt yourself above Heavenly Father, to sit in a position of power above him, to, with him to lead his people. Verse number 14, I will ascend Above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Isaiah says that Lucifer said unto him, said to himself that he would become higher than all the rest of God's children, that he would be like Heavenly Father Elohim himself. Verse number 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Yet he would be cast down into the deepest, most dark parts of hell. This is a contrast between the high position he desired and the depths to which he was sent instead, far away from God and his other spirit children. Verse number 16. They that seek thee shall narrowly look upon thee and shall consider thee and shall say, Is this the man who made the earth to tremble, that did shake the kingdoms? And all the other beings of hell will look at you and wonder if this is the person who caused the earth and its nations to shake and tremble with the temptations and the evil and the wickedness that he spread in them. Verse number 17. And made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, and opened not the house of his prisoners. And they will say, Is this the man who destroyed the world and its cities with evil, and yet did not set the ones he tempted free, but chained them to himself in misery and sin? Verse number 18, And all the kings of the nations, yea, all of them, lie in glory, every one of them in his own house. Isaiah compares how low Lucifer has sunk, with the faith that the earthly kings enjoy after their death. When they have bodies, they are buried at least. Lucifer, on the other hand, has sunk so low that even the privilege that's given to mankind to be, um, to be given a body, to be sent to earth, will not be his because he will have no body. He is a disembodied spirit who has been exiled from the kingdom of God. And because of this, he's lower than even the earthly men and even the earthly wicked who lived on earth and had bodies. Verse number 19, but thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch and the remnant of those who are, that are slain thrusts through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet. Here Isaiah goes back to his dual meanings of talking about both the king of Babylon and of Lucifer himself, implying that they're both similar of the same type seeking glory and to exalt themselves without caring about anybody else. Lucifer will never have a grave because he is a being who, did, who was not resurrected, who was not sent to earth with a body. He doesn't have a body, he's a disembodied spirit. The grave of the Babylonian king was never discovered either because it was likely that he was killed and just thrown into a common pit and buried like that. Verse number 20. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou, hasn't th because thou hasn't destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seeds of evildoers shall never be renowned. 
Isaiah talks about how Lucifer as Satan corrupted millions of Heavenly Father's children, tempting them to go astray and lose their eternal salvation. And because he did this, and because he has no body to bury, he won't even be thrown into the pit, into a pit like the common, like the common people, like the king of Babylon was, but face a worse end. Satan and his people, the ones who chose to follow him, will never be spoken of well. They will never be honored or respected in any form. They will never have any place either in any of God's kingdoms, but will be exiled from them all forever. Verse number 21. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquities of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. Isaiah says that the children of the wicked will be punished for the sins of their fathers, and unlike the righteous, they won't have resurrection or even the companionship of other people. Verse number 22, For I will rise up against them, said the Lord of hosts, cut off from Babylon the name, and remnant, and son, and nephew, said the Lord. Isaiah says that the Lord will attack Babylon and destroy all of it and its people. None will be left. Verse number 23. I will also make a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep with the besom of destruction, said the Lord of hosts. The Lord said that he would make a swamp that only the birds like the bittern and the fish inhabit, and nothing else will be left. The bittern is a kind of a crane or a stork-like bird that lives on fish in uninhabited swampy areas of water and land. The besom that the Lord is talking about is, is a tool that's used like a broom to wipe things clean. Verse number 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. Isaiah tells us that the Lord has sworn an oath or a promise, saying that I will make what I have said happen, and what I have decided must and will happen. Verse number 25, And I will bring the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. The Lord says that he will bring the Assyrians into his land, and then stamp on them and destroy them under his feet when they cross his mountain. The Lord continues that he will ensure that Assyria has no more power over the Israelites by causing that they will no longer be a tribute nation to Assyria and they won't be in debt or owe them anything any longer. We see this happen when King Hezekiah refuses to pay a tribute anymore to Assyria, who then decides to invade Israel, but are unable to defeat Jerusalem because the Lord sends his angel of death with an epidemic upon the Assyrian army, causing most of them to die. Verse number 26, and this is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. This is the Lord's plan for the world, and this is what he plans to make happen to all the nations on earth. Verse number 27, for the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who shall disannul? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? For the Lord has decided that this is what he's going to do, and who can stop it from happening? And his hand is stretched out, and who is going to be able to turn it back? I learned something yesterday from a John Hilton masterclass that I watched. I realized that perhaps in the Lord stretching out his hand, there were two possible meanings. I had only seen one. The one that I thought earlier with the Lord was that the Lord was implying that his hand was stretched out, always willing to help and redeem his people if they turned to him. I still think that is true, but there's also could be an alter alternative meaning that I learned from yesterday's masterclass. And that says that because of the peop of his people's behavior, even though the Lord has brought punishment on them, he is still angry and he still plans to punish them more for all their wrongdoings. And his hand is still stretched out with more still to come upon them. Verse number 28. In the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. And the punishment or burden that happens to the, happens happens in the year that King Ahaz dies. Remember, Ahaz had ignored Isaiah's advice from God and chosen instead to depend on the Assyrians instead of depending on God. Isaiah in this in these verses now next is warning Palestine of what will happen to them next. Verse number twenty nine. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be as a fiery fire flying serpent. Isaiah tells the Palestinians not to be too joyful because they'd survived two Assyrian attacks, and the kings that had attacked them were dead now. Isaiah warns them that there will be another attack from the Assyrian king, and this one would truly defeat them.
The last sentence warns the Palestinians that every Assyrian ruler that follows the last dead one will be worse than the old one. For example, for out from a snake will come a poisonous serpent, and from that poisonous serpent will come an even more dangerous flying poisonous serpent, implying that the last ruler will not just be the most dangerous, but he'll be the fastest to attack and to destroy. Verse number 30. And the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety. And I will kill thy root with famine, and ye shall slay thy remnant. Now Isaiah said, The Lord will look after the children of the poor of the righteous, humble and worthy, giving them refuge in Zion, and he will make them his people, and he will protect them. But the evil and the disobedient will face famine and death, and none will be left. Verse number 31. Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou, who, thou whole Palestina art dissolved, for they come from the north a smoke and none shall be alone in his appointed times. Even if you cry out, you're going to be destroyed by the Assyrian army that will come from the north and no one will be saved. Verse number 32. What shall then answer the messengers of the nations that the Lord had founded Zion and the poor of his people shall trust in it? Isaiah ends this chapter by saying that when the nations around the world will send people to Zion asking how they can stand strong against the invaders, the people of Zion will tell them that they are able to do so because this is the Lord's land, the land he has created and protects for the safety and the salvation of all his people, of all the righteous, the humble, the obedient who allow him to help them. Ponder this. What are some of the ways that we see the Babylonians and Lucifer being unrighteous in and turning away from God? Think about how you or I may be doing smaller versions of the same thing. Sometimes we don't realize the choices that we're making simply because we haven't thought them through. We haven't considered how one small temptation can lead to something so much bigger. We have not considered the path that they lead us to and how they encourage us to turn to wrongdoing. Think about what it is in your life that you could be doing right now that could be viewed as unrighteous in the Lord's eyes.